Okay, so this was the start signal. signal. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Moulet. I am the head of the OECD Anti-Corruption Division. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to thank you uh, for joining us today uh, to reflect on global enforcement efforts and how they can detect, investigate, and prosecute corruption during the COVID-19 pandemic and recovery period. I'd like now to introduce our opening speakers, uh, two of them. Um, we have, we are very pleased to have Mr. James Walsh, Acting Assistant Secretary of State, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs from the United States. And we have also Mr. Jeffrey Schlagenhoff, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, responsible for the coordinate for the coordination of the fight against corruption um, by the OECD. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, give the floor to Mr. James Walsh, please. Well, thank you, Patrick. And can you hear me? Great. Um, well, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here today to help kick off this really important discussion. Um, so we all know the corrosive impact corruption has on society. It threatens security, stability, hinders economic growth, undermines democracy and human rights, destroys trust in public institutions, and facilitates transnational crime. You know, during the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, corruption has had a significant human cost of tragic impact. Corrupt actors have used this crisis to siphon out funds from much needed emergency relief packages. In exchange for kickbacks, public officials have inappropriately awarded contracts to unqualified bidders for personal protective equipment and medical supplies, putting the lives of patients and frontline workers at risk. Increasing transparency and accountability by strengthening procurement processes and mechanisms for whistleblower protection and helping build capacity to investigate and prosecute these crimes has been a top priority for my organization and our partners over the last year. In response to this challenge, OECD and the US government have worked through regional law enforcement networks to provide a platform for law enforcement practitioners to share their experiences and best practices with corruption related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Network members have come together during this difficult time to share their challenges and successes in investigating and prosecuting corruption. This has led to a better understanding of what works and what does not when rapidly deploying resources during a crisis. They have also been able to build and strengthen relationships that facilitate information sharing related to corruption cases and tactics for preventing and investigating corruption. Not only is this exchange proven useful in the context of COVID-19, but the practices shared throughout this project will provide important input into strengthening countries' frameworks for tackling corruption in times of crisis. Corruption risks associated with the COVID-19 pandemic are not unique to the current situation. You know, we saw similar risk play out after the hurricane in New Orleans in 2005 and the Ebola outbreak in 2014, among other past crises as well. Unfortunately, the fact is there will be crises in the future that corrupt actors will use as an opportunity for personal enrichment. So by having a better understanding of how corruption has played a role in past crises, and in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we will be better prepared to prevent, detect, investigate, and prosecute corruption in the future. We can use this time as an opportunity to ensure that anti-corruption efforts in crises have paved the way for establishing far-reaching strategies to strengthen anti-corruption infrastructures. So I wanna thank our colleagues at OECD for their hard work on this project as well as the law enforcement network members for their dedication to preventing and investigating corruption. I really look forward to hearing from our panelists who have been directly involved in these peer exchanges about what we have learned so far. So thanks again for letting me join and participate and I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Back to you, Patrick. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Walsh. So now uh, it's up to uh, Mr. Schlagenhoff, Deputy Secretary of OECD to uh, make his opening remarks. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues, dear, par dear participants, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Let me start off by thanking Mr. James Walsh, Acting Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs, or INL, 
for providing an overview of the Bureau's work. This also provides me with the opportunity to acknowledge the leadership of the United States, not only in co-hosting today's event, but also in supporting the OECD's Global Law Enforcement Response Project. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented governments with unprecedented challenges, including increased corruption risk. But of course, corruption is not a new phenomenon. The current crisis has only exacerbated corruption risk and their impact. According to OEC data, the risk of corruption is widespread across many sectors, including public procurement, a critical sector for the post-COVID recovery, which accounts for 57% of foreign bribery cases concluded by state parties to the OECD anti-bribery convention between 1999 and 2014. These risks are even higher in emergency procurement processes in countries where market gaps and inconsistencies in public procurement tended to be prevalent even before the onset of a crisis. Indeed, in many parts of the world, law enforcement officials are actively pursuing COVID-19 related investigations and prosecutions against corrupt actors. And you will hear about some of those today. It is critical that governments remain committed to effectively preventing, detecting, investigating, and prosecuting corruption during this time of crisis. And we should be learning from this experience so that we are ready for future emergencies like this one. The OECD Anti-Bribery Convention plays a critical role in the global anti-corruption response. And now to our efforts to ensure that the COVID response is executed with integrity. Since its signature in 1997, the convention has been one of the strongest tools in our arsenal to ensure a level playing field for companies operating in global markets within and beyond the convention's 44 country membership. However, setting standards is not enough. This is why a key focus of the OECD's anti-corruption efforts is supporting practical implementation and enforcement. One example is the Working Group on Bribery. The group supports the implementation of the Anti-Bribery Convention. Its rigorous monitoring system exerts strong peer pressure on the 44 parties to the convention to reform their laws and institutions and to prioritize the prosecution of foreign bribery cases. It also encourages cooperation and a collaborative approach in the fight against transnational bribery including through critical cooperation with the UNODC Secretariat to the UN Convention Against Corruption. The working group spoke out early and clearly in the crisis on the need to address these challenges head on. We must keep up the momentum in our efforts to combat corruption so that corruption does not undermine our pandemic response. In addition to supporting the work of the working group on bribery, the OECD Anti-Corruption Division also provides tools and resources to law enforcement practitioners through its global law enforcement network and various regional law enforcement networks. These networks offer a forum where investigators and prosecutors working on corruption cases can exchange good practices and they facilitate international cooperation in the fight against corruption. Based on the experience and knowledge of these networks, the OECD with the support of the United States, launched in 2020 the Global Law Enforcement Response to Corruption in Crisis Situations Project in order to strengthen the capacities of law enforcement practitioners during and after the COVID-19 crisis. The project provides a peer learning framework through which law enforcement investigators and prosecutors can discuss the challenges and solutions in fighting corruption during the pandemic. Through its series of regional webinars, the project focuses on the areas most prone to corruption or essential in exposing corruption during crises, such as emergency public procurement, whistleblower reporting and protection, and interagency cooperation. To reach a sustainable impact over the long term, the project will be using the lesson learned from law enforcement officials in our networks to develop practical tools such as guidelines and training curricula that will promote broad application of good practices. Today's event brings together law enforcement officials 
from around the world, including speakers from Romania, Argentina, Thailand, and South Africa, to improve the detection, investigation, and prosecution of corruption during and in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, and to reflect on enforcement efforts so far. It is my hope that this will help us strengthen our resolve to fight corruption and our ability to do so. I look forward to an interesting discussion today. And once again, uh, let, let me thank Mr. Walsh and the US government for their support in this effort. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. I think now we can move to the, to the, to the panel discussion, but I would like to say a few words before. Uh, first of all, as usual in this kind of setting, there are some ground rules, uh, logistical rules that I need to remind uh, everyone. So the first uh, advice from, from us is uh, for participants, if you could turn on your cameras, if, uh, if this is allowed by your connection, and of course, mute yourselves uh, for a better quality uh, of the sound in the discussion. There's also uh, from Zoom, as you know, a chat function uh, where we'll be collecting questions for panelists and questions from the audience, obviously. So I invite you to submit your questions in the chat and then we'll try to um, incorporate or put together those questions uh, in, a, in a second round of questioning at, uh, at the end of the, of the panel today, if we have time. So, but in any case, uh, the, the information or the questions uh, uh, which will um, uh, be received in the chat function will be collected and provided to all participants in a follow-up email. Um, very briefly, I think it was said already by our Deputy Secretary General, uh, today we, we are uh, here to, to um, uh, promote uh, this project, uh, which was launched already in September 2020, but uh, it's important to keep in mind the main features of the project. Uh, the objective is really to strengthen the capacities of law enforcement practitioners to combat corruption during the COVID-19, but also during um, future crisis situations. And it's not only a matter of organizing webinars and talks, uh, there's also uh, uh, an important aspect of the project, which will be to develop training materials and practical tools for, uh, for law enforcement um, um, authorities. Um, this project uh, doesn't start from scratch. It builds on already existing networks uh, th uh, throughout the world and in various regions of the world, the networks of law enforcement officials, um, including some well-established networks, for example, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and also Latin America and Caribbean, whose chairs uh, of, of two networks, uh, regional, regional networks have joined us today. And of course, uh, in addition to the regional networks, there's also uh, what we call the GLEN, which is the OECD Global Law Enforcement Network Against Transnational Bribery. So this is to give you the, the background and, and the overall picture. Now I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, we have four panelists. I think we are very lucky today. We have, we have panelists from different parts of the world. Uh, and they'll discuss enforcement efforts in their respective regions. Um, they reflect also on, on the pandemic and what the pandemic has changed in the uh, challenges that law enforcement uh, communities face and how uh, the challenges have been addressed, whether there are some already uh, changes in the practice and good practice to, uh, to keep in mind. The speakers are, first of all, Ms. Um, Anka Jurma, um, she's an advisor to the Chief Prosecutor of the National Anti-Corruption Directorate, otherwise known as DNA, very famous in Romania. Uh, and she's also uh, the Chair of the Eastern Europe and Central Asia Law Enforcement Network. We have also Ms. Laura Roteta. She's the head of the Office of the Prosecutors Against Economic Crime and Money Laundering, otherwise known as PROSELAC in Argentina. And uh, Ms. Roteta is the co-chair of the Latin American Caribbean Law Enforcement Network. Then we have um, Ms. Alisa Rupp uh, Bankert. I hope 
I have pronounced your name correctly. Forgive me if it's not the case. Uh, you are from Thailand and you work at the National Anti-Corruption Commission in Thailand, other, uh, another well-known organization involved in the fight against corruption. Finally, I'm pleased to welcome also as a panelist, Mr. Peter Alberts, uh, Manager, Monitoring and Analysis Division of the Financial Intelligence Center. Uh, I guess this means the, the FIU of uh, South Africa. So we'll start now the kind of the first round of questions, which will last uh, about 20 minutes. It means that uh, panelists don't have a lot of time. It's approximately five minutes per panelist. So uh, I will start with uh, uh, Anka Jurma. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, given your role as, as a prosecutor and also being the co-chair, the chair, sorry, of the law enforcement network of the OECD for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uh, we really uh, want to learn about uh, whether uh, there have been some successful international cooperation in corruption cases, and maybe more sp specifically, as the pandemic changed the patterns of corruption in the region, and what has already been done, uh, and what could be done further to strengthen law enforcement capacities to respond efficiently to the new challenges. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I hope uh, everybody hears me well. Uh, and, and thank you also for uh, inviting me to this uh, important uh, round table. Uh, well, let me start by being somehow uh, philosophical and say that the pandemic uh, changed many things in our lives, but it did not change the human nature. In fact, in these times of crisis and COVID-19 pandemic is a huge global crisis, both the best and the worst of the human behavior comes to surface. We witnessed very emotional proofs of solidarity between people, uh, but also examples of people using this critical situation as an opportunity for corruption, fraud, and illicit personal enrichment. I suppose uh, in terms of pattern, uh, the situation in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia does not differ very much from the other parts of the globe. For us, two areas beca became most vulnerable to corruption during the pandemic, and they are the public procurement of uh, medical supplies, protective uh, equipment, ventilators, and other uh, vital equipment for the uh, treatment of the patients uh, infected with uh, this virus. And another vulnerable area to corruption concerns the access or distribution of the financial support packages. Um, the information that uh, we were able to collect in the meetings we had with our colleagues in the region, as well as the experience of my office, shows that the most, uh, most of the allegations we came across and most of the cases we opened in the context of the pandemic are cases of corruption and abuse of functions related to the public procurement of medical supplies. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, when most of the governments declared state of emergency uh, in order to ease the pressure of the healthcare systems that have been caught by this medical crisis unprepared, the public procurement procedures have been relaxed, simplified, many of the transparency elements uh, have been eliminated, uh, the possibilities of direct procurement have been extended. Uh, and this simplification was unfortunately used by many wrongdoers as an opportunity to elicit enrichment. Just to give you uh, some examples from the experience shared by our colleagues in the region, we had cases in which contracts for uh, protective equipment or medical supplies have been awarded to companies who had no previous experience in the field, no uh, or very few employees, uh, who did not have the necessary uh, licenses from the authorities, company who, companies who were registered only a few days before the contract was signed, meaning that the negotiation was carried out with a non-registered company. Many of these companies proved to be uh, affiliated to public officials who coordinated the public procurement process or the healthcare policy to political officials or, or to their families. 
Um, these contracts have been usually obtained uh, through the payment of bribes by traffic of influence or due to intentional violation of law by the public officials uh, entrusted with the decisive role in the public procurement with the purpose of obtaining undue advantages. In most of the cases, the price that the hospitals or the other authorities paid in the end was very much inflated, and that was um, because the winning company purchased the equipment through a complex fictitious commercial scheme involving numerous fake intermediaries, uh, sometimes from various countries. But also, we have to say, uh, because uh, the simplified public procurement procedure did not allow a proper competition between bidders, so the price could not be properly controlled. Also, the investigations uh, showed that often the products did not correspond to the technical specifications and could not be used for the purpose they have been purchased in exchange of so much money. Although the majority of the cases regarded corruption in procurement, we also had cases regarding the misuse of financial compensation, such as kickbacks given to hospital administrators for falsely registering medical staff as frontline workers entitled to additional payment. Um, with regard to your second part of the question on the uh, capacity of uh, law enforcement agencies to respond to the challenges of the pandemic, I should tell you that this issue uh, was since uh, last year and still is at the center of uh, our interest in the peer learning exercises uh, that our LEN organizes together with the uh, ACN Secretariat. We had uh, ACN Secretariat launched uh, last year a survey amongst our uh, agencies in order to understand better the impact that the pandemic had on the capacity uh, to detect, investigate and prosecute uh, and adjudicate corruption cases. And later we participated in two webinars on the topic of corruption related to pandemic, one regarding the uh, impact of uh, COVID-19 on the work of our agencies and the other related to the uh, emergency public procurement and uh, relief support. And we plan to have a third event uh, later this year um, uh, that we uh, very much hope we could uh, hold in person. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, during these meetings, we had the opportunity to exchange views with our colleagues and hear about challenges they have encountered in investigating corruption and uh, how they face them. Uh, obviously, uh, we suffered the same difficulties are, as all the other sectors uh, related to protection measures, lockdowns, quarantines, but in a specific way. So we had to prepare ourselves with protection materials so that we could conduct hearing procedures without putting ourselves and the participants to the investigation in danger. Um, to use, for instance, protection equipment when conducting searches. We had to adapt whenever this was possible on our procedures in order to use more often the electronic communication and the uh, video conferencing. Uh, and when the uh, interagency cooperation and the public authorities re reporting was very slow, especially in the beginning, uh, we had to rely more on journalists' investigations as a detection tool and on the extensive use of electronic and other analytical tools in the investigation. Of course, there's still room for further strengthening law enforcement agencies' capacities, and we will try to use the opportunities offered to us by OECD projects to address these issues. And uh, what crosses my mind now is, for instance, the need to improve the national legislations and practice related to the real and effective protection of the whistleblowers so we could use them more often in a detection of corruption. So, yeah, I hope I responded to your question. Yes, you, you, thank you very much for your comprehensive response, uh, Anka. And thank you so for uh, starting by uh, Straightening that the COVID-19 has really opened many opportunities for corruption, bribery, fraud, fraud and other wrongdoings. Uh, so uh, I think this is the starting point we, we should all have in mind. Now, turning to another region and, and quite similarly, uh, the Latin America and the Caribbean region has an active OECD law enforcement network. And, um, I think uh, the work in this region has been characterized by uh, really uh, a boost in international cooperation and B 
big cases of corruption, well known, I think they're all well known. And, uh, and for example, the Lava Jato, uh, um, which uh, was a case in Brazil, but the cooperation went much further than Brazil. So um, my question to uh, Miss La Laura Oteta is uh, whether um, uh, you have seen as a co-chair of this network in Latin America, uh, whether, rather you, how do you see rather the future of international cooperation? International cooperation was probably boosted several years ago. So what is the impact of the COVID-19 on the future of this international cooperation? And also related question, uh, what could be done to further strengthen um, the, 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 the regional and international cooperation, but with a focus maybe on enforcement capacities? Both awesome capacity. Sorry, Laura. Hi, hello to everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Nice to see you, Patrick, and thank you very much for inviting me to this event. Well, regarding to your question, I think that the increasing globalization accelerates transnational organized cr criminal cases. And of course, offenses like foreign bribery, uh, which have a transnational nature. Uh, this raises, uh, for me, two concrete challenges. On the one hand, the need of counting with agile and efficient international cooperation. And on the other hand, uh, to promote and enhance the coordination of criminal investigation. For the first uh, challenge I have mentioned, in not so distant times, uh, in areas such as uh, the lack, the request uh, of international cooperation was unusual. And uh, we knew only one way to do it, the MLAs. Uh, this used to take a very long, long time to be successful because of either a deficiency in their confection or in their response uh, delivered, which all in all, and is this is the important thing, uh, became an obstacle uh, for the progress of the investigations. Nowadays, the rule of complex criminal cases is to have a transnational component. Uh, therefore, international cooperation is essential. And in order to resolve successfully transnational cases, we need to come up uh, with a very good international cooperation strategy uh, from the very beginning of the investigation, whether to obtain evidence or to recover the product of the crime or the instrument used to commit uh, the crime. Uh, at the same time, experience uh, has shown us that uh, we must resort to other ways of cooperation in order to have a faster and more successful MLAs. Uh, with regard to the second challenge, this is assuring the coordination of criminal investigations. The transnational element of the crimes often results in that several countries have jurisdiction in the same case, which means that all of them have an interest in the investigation. In addition, the concept of jurisdiction is becoming increasingly broad. So uh, these cases, uh, the criminal phenomenon cannot be battled uh, in an efficient way by the action of an isolated country. For that reason, is a key to cooperate and work in a joint effort altogether. Uh, there is an increasing range of international cooperation mechanisms that can provide us uh, an answer to both challenges I have mentioned. Within this universe, uh, the trend, and I truly believe this, is to give more and more prominence to informal cooperation with networks. Uh, and among these networks, the Latin American and Caribbean Anti-Corruption Law Enforcement Network stands out. LACLEN is an initiative of the Working Group on Bribery Anti-Corruption Division, through which uh, law enforcement of the region share peer-to-peer -peer practical experience uh, based on real cases. Uh, we build networking and we share best practices. It also provides us with a vital platform to informal exchange of information to facilitate the provision of legal assistance among uh, the members of the LEN. 
uh, all of this improves the capacity of our investigations and prosecutions in complex corruption cases as foreign bribery and enable us to discuss topics from a regional approach. And this is very, very important because almost all the countries in the region will have a similar problems and realities and we share the same legal culture and background. The LACLAM meets once a year. The inaugural meeting was held in Argentina, the second meeting in Brazil. And last year, due to the COVID-19, we have to, to meet virtually. And this year, we will meet virtually again, as, as my colleague has said, I hope, fingers crossed, to, to meet face-to-face uh, -face again next year. Indeed, the main issues we have discussed in these meetings were cooperation and coordination of multi-jurisdictional corruption cases uh, and corporate liability, which in practical terms is a rather new topic in the region. Also, we have some uh, webinar in the last meeting about the impact of the COVID in uh, corruption cases. LACLEM enabled to generate a trust between the contact points, which is of key for generating a national and fluid exchange of information and allow us to have faster and more efficient MLAs. In practical terms, this translates into better opportunities to assure obtaining uh, evidence or to assets recovery. For that reason, it is necessary to provide institutional and financial support to these networks uh, such as LACLEN. In future, it would also be desirable to establish some kind of less bureaucratic and modern and faster transmission of translation. Laura, I think uh, we could not hear, unfortunately. Ah, you're back. Sorry? You just missed, we, we, we just missed, sorry, the last minute of what you were saying. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was saying that these networks generate a, an enabled environment a, for us to overcome also the, the second challenge. Uh, as they allow us to meet each uh, other and serve as a bridge uh, into a more collaborate uh, investigations. And the future, uh, Patrick, I believe of international cooperation regarding transnational crimes, such as foreign bribery, uh, corruptions, rest uh, in the possibility of uh, creating joint investigation teams or carry out a coordinate, a coordinate a parallel investigation. This uh, will not uh, only serve us uh, for a better uh, cooperation, but also to perform successfully investigation and a much more equal distribution of the asset recovers. I don't know if I answered the questions and, and sorry about uh, the disconnection. No problem. Yes, uh, you answered perfectly the question, Laura. And uh, the problem was uh, with the, the computer. It was not. Uh, it was not yourself, obviously. So um, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, it's uh, to make the distinction between international cooperation, like of the past, with MLA and and the long and formal request, and maybe not so efficient. And really, uh, the value of uh, the regional networks that uh, we are trying uh, at BWCD, but not only us, we can do anything ourselves with the countries and the countries of the working group on bribery and other countries, is really to uh, spread uh, throughout the world this technique, I mean, this, uh, uh, this method of uh, bringing together law enforcement experts in region because it has really two main purpose. You said it: uh, uh, cooperation and coordination in corruption cases. And these are exactly the words that yesterday we heard during another panel uh, organized by the Working Group on Bribery. Enforcement is the key. And I think those two words were the words used by the um, chief of the fraud station at the Department of Justice in the U.S. So you see, uh, there is a, a convergence of view here. So um, let's. Um, uh, 
continue uh, a tour of the world. And now we are uh, going to, to Asia. And uh, as I said the, uh, before uh, in the presentation, in presenting her, uh, the NACC, uh, uh, National Anti-Corruption Commission of Thailand is a very well-known uh, organization. We've worked with them for so many years now, but I think uh, they have uh, interesting um, um, uh, information or data or to share with us. I mean, they have, they have interesting work to share with us uh, because apparently you, you, you worked a lot in uh, the identification of the risks, the corruption risks uh, linked to the COVID-19. And I think even a report was published from what I've heard. I'm not familiar with the report. My, my two questions uh, for you uh, today uh, would be uh, um, how uh, the NACC uh, has adapted uh, it, their investigation uh, to address uh, corruption allegations in the context of COVID-19. And, um, and if you could uh, give us an example of, of a case uh, or cases, uh, please, you have the floor. Uh, hello, can you hear me clearly? Hello? We can okay. hear you very well. You. Uh, every, everyone okay. was nodding, you know, so the time. Oh, yeah, because when the screen well. just gets so small, so I didn't see that clearly. Okay, well. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I would like to also thank the OECD for having me today to talk about the NACC. Uh, so uh, before I get to those uh, specific points in, in the questions, uh, allow me to uh, give our audience, uh, as well as my fellow speakers, a brief background of what we do at the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So uh, the, NAC the NACC is Thailand's primary anti-corruption agency uh, with constitutional mandate uh, as a, an independent anti-corruption agency, our work comprises prevention of corruption, investigation and, and inquiry into corruption cases, as well as assets inspection of public officials. Uh, so as our works are in these three points are, let's say interrelated. Uh, I would like to begin with the prevention side that during the pandemic, our prevention bureaus published a report to as a, uh, Patrick correctly mentioned, uh, uh, the, this report identifies and analyzes corruption risks, which um, derives from the studies of patterns of corruption during crisis in the part, past, which occurs in Thailand. Uh, this report also includes policy recommendations to government agencies for uh, corruption prevention during the pandemic and uh, other possible crises in the future. Uh, here, I would like to speak a bit about how this study by the NACC proposes possible solutions as as well as policy recommendations such as um, to review the existing laws and regulation and implement new practices to administer emergency situations, especially in relation to donation and recovery funds for those affected by the crisis. Um, another point would be to encourage the use of existing reporting mechanism and promote citizen and media participation to improve transparency in procurement process. Uh, moreover, protection of whistleblowers and witnesses should be priority. Uh, for investigation or our enforcement um, duties. Since the pandemic, government agencies have introduced, uh, like a lot of countries, uh, government agencies have introduced a number of urgent relief measures. In response to this urgency, these measures often include bypassing or exemptions to the general public procurement processes under regulatory requirements. And such process therefore inherently poses corruption risk, for example, in the form of public procurement fraud and unlawful facilitation to contractors. At the NACC, we have received several complaints in relation to procurement of COVID-19 related supplies. Most of them involve purchasing of substandard or overpriced goods or demanding of bribes and commission fees by the public officials. Uh, one of the cases which I have uh, described it in my presentation last year, uh, it occurred during the first wave of the pandemic. A provincial administrative organization, or the PAO, has been alleged of its budget spending of over 16 million baht, or that is a bit over 500,000 US dollars, to purchase sets of essential items for the elderly during the pandemic. In the course of investigation, our investigators and local citizens in, in that 
province, jointly surveying the market prices of those items and found that the purchased goods were un unreasonably, unreasonably high, which highly inflated. And uh, in our final report, it was also found that the PAO's project uh, in a way facilitated their contractors through bypassing of the procurement process due to the pandemic urgency in violation of a number of regulations. So at present, the NACC has concluded our findings for corruption and has now submitted the case report to the Office of Attorney General for formal prosecution in court. So it may be noted here that um, for the NACC particularly, and that uh, during the pandemic, we have been actively working with our citizen networks from our public engagement project throughout the country on the prevention side, as well as on the investigation. Uh, on the prevention front, we launched a project called Corruption Risk Mapping, which allows citizens to report red flags for corruption in their areas or provinces, as well as uh, working with them during investigation phases, as I have outlined in the previous case. So um, I hope that answer your, your question about our changes strategy, strategy during the pandemic for investigation and enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, interesting uh, information. And uh, it's true that when we want to deal with an issue, uh, I mean, criminal uh, um, criminal issue, uh, financial crime issues, it's important to, to analyze the phenomenon and to know the typology. And what we are doing also now is not uh, uh, coming with new information, uh, I think it's interesting to keep in mind that uh, uh, what, what you just said and what will uh, be said by, I guess, the next speakers were uh, topics and information already uh, presented to some extent in webinars uh, organized uh, by, by the OECD um, in, in, um, in specific regions of the world. So let's continue uh, this uh, global tour and now, uh, to moving to Africa um, and where um, uh, there is in South Africa this interesting um, body which is called the Fusion Center. I was really intrigued by, by the name uh, and uh, but, but, but this Fusion Center has, has an important role. Uh, I think I will understand this from uh, Mr. Peter Albert's presentation uh, or rather answering my questions uh, the, the role of this center in um, uh, dealing with the complex nature of the financial investigations. So, Mr. Albers, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, whether you could describe the work uh, being conducted by the center uh, and the distinct case typologies that the center has prepared or has seen during the COVID-19. And of course, always better to have an example. If you could share an example with the audience, uh, we would be grateful. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, uh, good day to all of the participants in the webinar. And, and thank you to the OECD for arranging this, this webinar and inviting us. Um, so, so yeah, I just want to take a step back in terms of the Fusion Center. Uh, the Financial Action Task Force in 2016 endorsed and encouraged serious big sense to start um, creating what they call financial information sharing partnerships. Um, and uh, we in South Africa in 2018 uh, adopted, um, under the Anti-Corruption Task Team, adopted a, a structure which we call the Fusion Center, and it's a public-public corporation. The intention is uh, for law enforcement to collaborate in terms of, of AML, CFT, anti-money laundering and counter financing of terrorism initially. Um, and, and then we've also created what we call SAMLA, the South Africa Money Laundering Integrated Task Force to feed uh, financial information from the banking community into, into this fusion center. But then um, the, the challenge we have after we've adopted the, the structure and the, the concept uh, in 2020, we've um, all experienced the COVID pandemic and, and we're looking internationally, globally and seeing some of the risks with, with increased spending from government. Um, we've identified that we would need to have a intervention in, in, in responding to, to some of the corruption issues um, dealing with, with public procurement. So the, the mandate of the fusion then 
was established as a law enforcement collaboration to focus on, on prevention, detection, and, and responding in, in a way of investigating, prosecuting, and recovering some of the assets. And this all to do with allegations of corruption and financial crime in, in, in relation to relief and containment efforts by the government. And, and the question is why? I mean, we've, we've picked up and, and looking at risks uh, around the world that the people are, are really <coughs> benefiting from illegal activities um, in terms of when, when there's an increased um, procurement uh, situation from, from government side. So uh, this, the stakeholders of the Fusion Center, we have uh, intelligence agencies um, that's represented in the Fusion Center. Um, I'm, I'm the chair of the hub, but what we call the, the Fusion Hub. So, so the, the, the Financial Intelligence Center or the FIU, as it's been known globally, are hosting the, the Fusion Hub. Uh, so we have intelligence agencies representing the FRC. Uh, we have state security agency dealing with, with state security and then the National Intelligence Coordinating, as well as our crime intelligence colleagues from the SA Police Service. Uh, and then in terms of investigative, uh, investigative agencies, we have uh, our directorate for priority crimes, uh, uh, dealing with priority investigations and the detective services of the police services. And then we also have representatives from the National Prosecuting Authority dealing with the prosecutions and asset recoveries. We, uh, our revenue services uh, is also represented to look at, at the, the recovering of taxes um, associated with this. And then we have our special investigation unit that deals with uh, maladministration and corruption in, in government departments. In the work of the Fusion Center, we, we, we have uh, four operational pillars. We, we look at prevention, so engaging uh, and interfacing with government departments uh, involved in, in procurement um, and, and seeing how can we share information. Um, sharing some of that information to, to the banking community for them to proactively identify some of the issues. Then we have the detection um, pillar, um, uh, where we scan the media, looking at open source information, uh, whistleblower reports, uh, intelligence reports from the Financial Intelligence Center, as well as our intelligence community, um, but, but also receiving uh, information from the banking community. We've really uh, uh, heavily relied on them, and, and from the start, they're involved in identifying some of the su suppliers that's problematic. Um, then we have uh, from the Fusion Hub site supporting the, the criminal investigations uh, that's been done in the regions um, and, and then also assisting the, the prosecuting authority that's, that's dealing, dealing with the prosecutions in the region. Um, and then the recovery that's, that's associated with that um, is also being supported by the Fusion and, and closely monitored. So, so the information, the financial information sitting in the Fusion Hub is then shared with, with the, the colleagues um, dealing with, with the, the issues. So some of the successes so far, we've seen uh, 24 cases in Port 1 being successfully finalized. Um, we've, uh, from the FRC side, blocked bank accounts, um, 103 bank accounts to, to more than 200 million. Our asset forfeiture unit recovered uh, more than 120 million. Um, our special investigation unit close to 300 million. And that's also the African rands now. Um, and then our revenue services looking at about 250 million. Um, so, so working together as a collective, uh, we were able to, to, to recover all of these and, and to be able to get some of these criminal matters. And we all know this is complex matters and it takes some time to investigate and get these matters in a, in a court process. So some of the, the case typologies we are seeing, um, we can divide it into four areas. Uh, first is the procurement irregularities. Um, the next one is about pricing. Uh, from suppliers and then questionable suppliers of, of PPEs, um, public um, or, 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 uh, or protective equipment, and then the abuse of grants and then unemployment benefits by, by individuals. So, so typically in procurement irregularities, um, the, the non-compliance with procurement irregularities by government departments, uh, they abused uh, emergency procurement provisions uh, in, in this time to procure items that's not essential. So a lot of non-essential goods were procured. Um, we've also seen that some of the PPEs were never delivered um, or, or late delivered uh, by suppliers. In terms of pricing, uh, excessive pricing were, were charged by suppliers. We've also seen that um, uh, we have a regulated pricing list from, from our national treasury and, and suppliers with, with charged uh, in excess of, of these regulated pricing the, despite the, the list in place. We've seen recently uh, registered entities with our central um, company register um, as, as, as early as, as February and March 2020 and, and getting large government contracts. 
Uh, again, also when you look at the nature of business uh, registered, um, so typically you will find a car wash that, that's supplying PPE or medical equipment to government. We also have a, a standard where we indicate that all, all suppliers need to be registered on our central um, uh, uh, suppliers database. And a lot of these entities, it was awarded contracts, were never registered. Um, and then uh, for a supplier to provide PPEs uh, in our jurisdiction, they need to be registered with the, the Health Products Regulatory Authority. And, and a lot of these uh, entities never registered uh, or been endorsed by, by this uh, authority, um, and, and they supplied PPEs or medical equipment. And then looking at the tax issues again about the, the questionable suppliers, um, they, they would uh, not be registered for any tax uh, compliance uh, or, or uh, reporting uh, on tax issues, um, and, and all of a sudden they're getting large contracts. Um, so, so the issue about grants and unemployment benefits, I'll just quickly touch on that in, 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 a, in a case study. So the specific uh, typical case study or, or case study that we worked on in, in the FUSE and, um, and it's an ongoing matter, um, we, we have an unemployment insurance fund under our Department of Labor in South Africa uh, and they um, have uh, instituted uh, a, a regime which they call the Temporary Employer or Employee Relief Scheme uh, in COVID. So employers uh, would have qualified to apply for, for the employees um, in, in the time of the lockdown where they're unable to work. So um, on one of these uh, entities, um, over 100 million was paid into a bank account. Uh, the bank were very un uncomfortable with, with the payment as they could have seen from, from the, the history or legacy in guys and with this um, company, there was no payments to the revenue services or no payments as salaries uh, and the such. Um, and, and they informed the diffusion center as well as the, the Department of Labor. Um, and there was a request then to block um, and, and freeze the transactions in the bank account. Um, the individual that uh, submitted, um, and he purported to be a mining company, who submitted these fraudulent claims, he ultimately um, then uh, approached the government official and indicated that they will pay a bribe to, to get the, the monies uh, unfreeze and, and to be released to him. Um, and, and luckily for us, this information came forward and a, a, a uh, operation was set up and, and the guy with the charge oh, were arrested for, for, um, for corruption. Um, so, so this case is currently before a criminal court uh, on charges of corruption, uh, fraud and, and money laundering. Also, interestingly, because of the sharing of information in the fusion center, we were able to, to preserve about 99% of, of the money that was stolen from the government department. So, so uh, the, the story or the, the success that we can say from, from this is working together. We're able to, to very quickly uh, respond to this and, and be able to work together and, and um, save some, some money. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was uh, important to uh, spend a moment on the uh, on the uh, importance of the interagency coordination, uh, which is uh, an essential aspect uh, of, of the fight against corruption and any other financial crimes. I think we are reaching not the end, but we are nearing the end of the of the, of the panel, which is unfortunately, I would say, only one hour. I, I, I think there'll be so much to say. Uh, and maybe to, to hear from the audience, I've uh, just glanced at the chat, with, uh, which is very active, by the way. I've seen that uh, uh, participants answer to each other, and uh, there was a question for, to Mr. James Walsh, and he has answered, and uh, Alice has uh, an AACC report, very popular also, a lot of demand, so I think that that's good. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, I don't think uh, we have the time to, to look at all the questions. There were two specific questions for the OECD and maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, make an attempt to answer. Uh, one question was about uh, whether the OECD has rules uh, against uh, gray corruption as the author of the question said or wrote. Uh, yes, there are guidelines at the OECD. Uh, we call them recommendations on uh, lobbying, conflict of interest, revolving doors. So this is more on the side of prevention, but I think it complements well uh, the work that we do around the OECD anti-bribery convention, uh, which is more focused on criminal law and law enforcement matters. And um, 
There was also a question as to whether the OECD support uh, the establishment of international anti-corruption courts. Um, I, I don't think this is the case, or, or maybe we have not really uh, discussed. No, there is no, sorry, there is no, there is no uh, position of the organization on the specific uh, proposal which comes regularly in the international debate against corruption. Looking at the clock, and if I know that if I go after four, uh, my colleagues will be very unhappy. Uh, so um, I would like really uh, do one thing very simple, which is but but very deserve. Thank you very much. Uh, thank the panelists really for bringing all the experience. I think that was very uh, uh, complimentary. What uh, complimentary what they what, what they said, and I think uh, they provide you with a good overview of the new situation of the fight against corruption in the context of COVID-19, but all the lessons learned uh, during this project today, but in the continuation of the project will be useful not only to combat corruption in the context of COVID-19, but co combat corruption also through the, the announcement of local force and capacities in uh, fighting corruption in kind of every uh, crisis situation. So, um, I can assure you that uh, the OECD uh, anti-corruption division will will continue to to support uh, the project. Uh, we heard today a lot of experience about this project, the global law enforcement project, and it will be more exchanges, more exchange of views, uh, sharing lessons, good practices, uh, but um, it will um, be also. Uh, quite practical with the development of guidelines and also training curriculum for, for practitioners. So we are not only talking, we are also acting and we'll try to give good material, uh, materials and guidelines which could be used uh, by all uh, law enforcement authorities in their daily work. So um, looking forward to the next phase of the project. And thank you again, everyone, for uh, following this uh, uh, even today, a uh, side event organized in the context of the UNGAS. Uh, I think it was very interesting and uh, thank you uh, all the participants, panelists and my colleagues from the Secretariat of the OECD. So now I have to say goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.